he goes on to the next paragraph. I am by theory obdurate to the seductiveness of what are called a fine set of teeth. Every pair of rosy lips, the ladies must pass, pardon me, is a casket presumably holding such jewels. But methinks they should take leave to air them as frugally as possible. The fine lady or fine gentleman who show me their teeth show me bones. Yet must I confess that from the mouth of a true sweep, a display, even to ostentation, of those white and shining ossifications strikes me as an agreeable anomaly in manners and an allowable piece of foppery. It is as when a sable cloud turns forth her silver lining on the night. Okay, he says, I am by theory obdurate. Obdurate means uh, stubborn. He is generally stubborn. Uh, regarding the, the seductiveness of the teeth means he doesn't like people exposing their teeth and every pair of rosy lips so he says when I look at any rosy lips so he says the ladies please forgive me but I consider a pair of rosy lips as a casket holding jewels or the teeth for him what he means to say is that he finds nothing romantic in a pair of rosy lips to him, any pair of rosy lips is only a kind of a casket or a container which holds these jewels of the teeth. And he believes that people should not expose their teeth or smile too widely too often. He feels it is bad manners. Whether a fine lady or a fine gentleman who show me their teeth, show me bones. So look at how unromantic he is. He says, when I look at teeth, I think, oh. He is showing me the bones. He doesn't think of the beautiful teeth and the well lined teeth, the whiteness, the glitter, nothing. Instead, he, the moment he sees teeth, he says, there, I can see bones. Yet, I must confess that from a mouth of a true sweep. But he says, when he sees this very same thing, the white and shining ossification, ossification is bone formation. So he says the only place where only face or the only faces where I find this exposing of the teeth agreeable is on the face of uh, a chimney sweep because chimney sweep is generally covered in black and so this white teeth, a display of white teeth lights him up. So that is the only face on which Elia would enjoy a smile a teeth revealing smile an open smile he doesn't like it on any other face he hates it when people show too much of their teeth but he loves it when a chimney sweep smiles with all his teeth exposed and he is reminded of uh, this line as when a sable cloud turns forth her, uh, her silver lining on the night so here um, Charles Lamb quotes a line from the play Comus written by Milton, by John Milton and there is a reference to a sable cloud turns forth a silver lining on the night. So sable, black, a black cloud suddenly reveals a silver lining on the night and it's a beautiful sight. There is black everywhere and suddenly you see a silver lining. So that is how uh, this a smile, a white uh, toothed smile looks on the dark face of a chimney sweep. So uh, Elia says, I love to see a chimney sweep smiling. The next paragraph, it is like some remnant of gentry not quite extinct. A badge of better days, a hint of nobility and doubtless under the obscuring darkness and double night of the forlorn disguisement oftentimes lurketh good blood and gentle conditions derived from lost ancestry and a lapsed pedigree. The premature apprenticements of these tender victims give but too much encouragement, I fear, to clandestine and almost infantile abductions. The seeds of civility and true courtesy, so often discernible in these young grafts, not otherwise to be accounted for, plainly hint at some forced adoptions. Many noble Rachels mourning for their children, even in our days, countenance the fact. The tales of fairy spiriting may shadow a lamentable variety, verity. And the recovery of the young Montagu 
be but a solid, solitary instance of good fortune out of many irreparable and hopeless defiliations. So here he says that uh, in a, this smile, it is like some remnant of gentry, not quite extinct. Uh, the good-natured smile that he sees on uh, many, uh, on the faces of many of these uh, chimney sweeps, he says it's like a remnant of gentry not quite extinct. Gentry is the gentleman folk. And so he says, um, these children, uh, when they smile, I see a hint of nobility in them. In spite of the obscuring darkness, that is this uh, darkness of the suit, and the double night of the forlorn disguisement. Uh, double night in the sense one is that they are themselves, you know, they are uh, one is that uh, they are disguised in this dark suit and they are dirty clothes, and uh, they are also disguised because um, they are not clean and because they are always forced to work in the dark but in spite of that in spite of this double night they oftentimes lurketh there oftentimes lurketh good blood so in spite of all that he says that they have an innate good blood so they many of them he has a feeling belong to noble families derived from lost ancestry or they all belong to families of dignified ancestry. Um, pedigree, you know, is that belonging to good blood. The premature apprenticements of these tender victims. And so now he uh, throws some light into this practice of how um, this need for, this demand for chimney sweeps uh, actually led to many kidnappings of how many children were kidnapped from their homes in order to be sold as chimney sweeps. So there are many stories that uh, Elia himself has heard uh, of families who had lost their children, little boys who were uh, taken away when they were very young. And so that is why he says the premature apprenticements of these tender victims give too, but too much encouragement. I fear to clandestine and infantile abductions. So uh, making this these children apprentices when they are too little. This practice has he calls them tender victims. Charles Lamb says that the practice of uh, taking very little children, young children as apprentices has led to this inhuman practice of children being kidnapped from many families and there are many a family that has lost a child due to this reason and that is why he says that um, the seeds of civility and to, true courtesy so often discernible in these young grafts uh, not otherwise to be accounted for, plainly hint at some forced adoptions. So he says many of these chimney sweeps, though they are young, they are so well mannered and very civil and very courteous in their behavior. And he says this must be because they uh, belong to some noble family from where they have been forcefully taken away. Many noble Rachels mourning for their children even in our days countenance the fact and he says there are many noble Rachels maybe Rachel is the name of a noble lady who lost her child and so he says you would find many such noble Rachels who mourn for their lost children the tales of fairy spiriting may shadow a lamentable verity fairy spiriting uh, I think is the belief that fairies sometimes take away children uh, we have heard of that in uh, in uh, folk tales about how fairies come and rob little things from the houses and same way how they take away children who they are very fond of. And so here uh, he says the tales of fairy spirit may shadow a lamentable verity. So these uh, stories about fairy spiriting are only a kind of a shadow or they cover the lamentable verity, lamentable sad verity 
truth. So these stories about fairies taking away children only serve to cover up or camouflage a very unpleasant and a very sad truth. And what is that sad truth? That children are being kidnapped. And the recovery of the young Montagu be but a solitary instance of good fortune out of any irreparable and hopeless defiliation. So he says that um, there is there was one very popular story about uh, a young boy who belonged to the uh, aristocratic family of the Montagus. So the child had been taken away by uh, one of these groups who were hunting for children to work as ch chimney sweeps. And uh, many years later, at least a few years later, uh, this child happened to come to this very same house of his. Not knowing that it is his house, he was assigned to clean the chimney in that particular house. And this was a huge mansion, many chimneys, multiple chimneys and um, narrow flues and pipes. And he found himself, he was lost in those flues and he found himself in one of the rooms. When he tried to come out, he found himself in a room that definitely was not the place where he was supposed to land and when he looked around that room he felt that there was something very very familiar about this room he felt as if he had seen this place before and then he opened a door and stepped into the, another room and there he found a lady sitting and crying and then the child recognized that this was his mother and he ran to her calling mother and the mother was overjoyed and it is said that this lady Montagu she uh, used to uh, give annual feasts for all chimney sweeps because it was this practice of chimney sweeping that of course in the first place took away the child that's a fact but it is this very same practice that once again brought back the child to her house so that is the story of the young Montagu. So he says the recovery of the young Montagu is just a solitary instance of good fortune. But there are so many cases, irreparable cases and hopeless cases where children have been um, defiliated, means they have been taken away from their families forever. So that is uh, what he says about children being kidnapped in the name of chimney sweeping. Now, uh, in the next paragraph, um, Charles uh, Lamb tells us uh, of an instance where uh, a child, a, a little chimney sweeper was found sleeping in the beds, in the bed of Arundale Castle. Okay, so Arundale uh, Castle again is the home of the very noble uh, Howard's family and so uh, there, it seems, in one of the state beds at Arundale Castle, a few years since under a ducal canopy. Ducal is anything related to dukes and dukedom. So the, that seat of the Howards is an object of curiosity of to visitors. So he says that the Howards and the Arundale Castle uh, has a display of so many beautiful beds and uh, very stately and huge beds and uh, the duke the late Duke of Howard was a great connoisseur, you know, had, um, I mean, he was a great connoisseur of art and he was again an expert uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the quality of beds and about setting up huge beds and all that. It was, he was interested in that and it is said that in one of these beds encircled with curtains of delicatest crimson with starry coronets inwoven, folded between a pair of sheets whiter and softer than the lap where Venus lulled Ascanius. So there on that bed, uh, they, it was encircled with uh, um, curtains of very delicate crimson, okay, light red and it had starry coronets. Coronets are light crowns or um, simple crowns that you wear. So such designs were woven on those uh, curtains and white sheets, such beautiful pure white sheets were spread on this bed and in between the pair of sheets 
whiter and softer than the lap where Venus lulled Ascanius was discovered by chance after all methods of search had failed at noon day, fast asleep, a lost chimney sweep. So what happened was this, a few chimney sweepers had come to clean the chimneys of Arundel Castle, uh, Arundel Castle and after some time it was found that one child had gone missing and people searched high and low for uh, the child. They even looked up uh, um, the chimney but he couldn't be found and uh, late in the afternoon they found this child fast asleep on one of these grand beds of the castle and he was lying very comfortably asleep between a pair of sheets whiter and softer than the lap where Venus lulled Ascanius. Now, Venus and Ascanius. This, uh, these are characters from uh, the Roman mythology and Venus here is the goddess Venus and um, Ascanius is the son of Aeneas who is the son of Venus. So Ascanius is the grandson of Venus and so here uh, these sheets were compared the sheets are compared to the white and soft laps lap where Venus lulled Ascanius her little grandson to sleep and so in such beautiful sheets soft and white and fluffy the child was fast asleep the little creature having somehow confounded his passage among the intricacies of these lordly chimneys by some unknown ap aperture had lighted upon this magnificent chamber and tried, tired with his tedious explorations was unable to resist the delicious invitement to repose which he here which he there saw exhibited. So creeping between the sheets very quietly laid his black head upon the pillow and slept like a young Howard. So what had happened was this, this child, this little creature, he was lost, he was confounded uh, confounded his passage means this is a it was a huge chimney sometimes in this big mansions you have so many chimneys from different fireplaces in the house and they would all there would be six or seven chimneys going up and they would be all be connected through pipes and flues and the child had got lost somewhere in between and he through some unknown aperture aperture means opening through some opening he managed to uh, alight or climb down into this room this magnificent chamber and there he was already tired because of his tedious explorations you can imagine how much of time he must have spent lost and um, afraid inside those crawling up and down inside those uh, pipes and so when he came down he was so tired with his tedious explorations and he was unable to resist the invitation of the bed repose is rest or sleep and so when he saw this beautiful bed there, he crept in between the sh sheets, he laid his black head upon the pillow and slept like a young Howard, like a young boy belonging to the Howard family who lived in the Arundel castle. Okay. Such is the account given, this is the next paragraph, such is the account given to the visitors at the castle. But I cannot help seeming to perceive a confirmation of what I have just hinted at in this story. A high instinct was at work in the case, or I am mistaken. Is it probable that a poor child of the description, with whatever weariness he might be visited, would have ventured under such a penalty as he would be taught to expect to uncover the sheets of a duke's bed and deliberately to lay himself down between them when the rug or the carpet presented an obvious couch still far above his pretension? Is this probable, I would ask, if the great power of nature which I contend for had not been manifested within him prompting to the adventure. So now, uh, after telling us the story about the child, the chimney sweep who was found asleep in the Duke's bed, Charles Lamb tells us, uh, this is a story that is told to the visitors who go to the castle. But he says, I don't believe this. I don't believe that a child belonging to a poor family uh, would if he if at all he happens to find himself in a room like this he will very happily sleep in a rug or the carpet in that room because even that would be above what he has seen in his house even a rug uh, would be a luxury for a poor child 
And so definitely a child of a poor family, unknown to the luxuries of a duke's chamber, would definitely sleep on the rug or the carpet on the floor. He would not clamber into a bed because he knows that that is not the place meant for him. And he knows he will be penalized, penalty, he would be punished for that. So he would definitely not clamber onto that bed and fall asleep there. So what is the theory that uh, Charles Lamb is putting forward? He is trying to tell us that he believes that this child who fell asleep in the bed must be, must definitely be a child belonging to noble ancestry. That is why a child who when the child was able to, uh, you know, he knew that the bed is where you have to sleep and how he crawled onto the bed and he got in between the sheets. Because uh, uh, otherwise, if even otherwise, the, the, the other, any other child maybe would sleep on the floor or maybe atop the bed. But to get right in between the sheets like a child who used to do it, it definitely must mean that he belonged to a noble family. And so he says, what else? How else can we uh, describe this adventure? Doubtless this young nobleman, for such my mind misgives me that he must be, was allured by some memory, not amounting to full consciousness of his condition in infancy, when he was used to be lapped by his mother or his nurse in just such sheets as he here found, into which he was now but creeping back as into his proper incunabula. So he says, this young nobleman, he, he says, I am going to call him a nobleman because I believe that this child must have been kidnapped from some uh, noble family. Okay, And so he says, I am sure that the child when he saw this bed, he must have been allured, attracted by some memory. And the memory may not be clear, it might be muddled because he must have been taken away from his home when he was some three or four. And so not amounting to full consciousness means he cannot fully recall those memories but then uh, maybe it came back to him that uh, when he was an infant either his mother or his nurse uh, must have put him to sleep in such a bed so that memory a vague memory of having slept in a bed like this long time ago that comes back to his mind and that is why he would have crept back to his proper incunabula. Incunabula, I think in this particular context means cradle or uh, the place of birth. Incunabula, when I referred, has another meaning too, which is not relevant here. It means, uh, it, uh, incunabula is also applied uh, to uh, refer to a book, books that were printed before 1501 using the old technology of printing. So here, in this context, I feel the more suitable meaning would be a cradle or a place of birth. So the child felt very much at home there because this was something that he was already used to. And uh, so this is what Charles Lamb tells us. He believes that this child must definitely be of noble blood. By no other theory than by this sentiment of a pre-existent state, as I may call it, can I explain a deed so venturous and indeed any other system so indecorous in this tender but unseasonable sleep. So he says this is the only sensible explanation for uh, the action of, for the act of the child because it's a venturous, venturous in the sense it's a great, it's an adventurous deed indeed because for a child a chimney sweep to clamber onto the bed of a duke and fall asleep there is in, indeed a great adventure and again it's indecorous also because chimney sweeps definitely are not permitted to enter other rooms in a house. So this definitely must be the only possible explanation for what the child did. Now Charles Lamb goes on to the next paragraph. My pleasant friend Jem White was so impressed with the belief of metamorphosis like this frequently taking place that in some sort to reverse the wrongs of fortune in these poor changelings he instituted an annual feast of chimney sweepers 
at which it was his pleasure to officiate as host and waiter. So he says, my pleasant friend, he goes on to Jem White. Jem White is actually a reference to, uh, uh, to the author and lifelong friend of Charles Lamb called James White. So James White again was a nobleman and he believed this theory uh, that uh, Charles Lamb put forth and so he felt that he should do something to alleviate the sufferings of uh, the chimney sweepers and so in his own way what he tried to do was uh, to reverse the wrongs of fortune of these poor changelings he decided to give an annual feast for these children and he himself would be there it is not as if he paid somebody else to do it he himself would be there as the host and the waiter and he would serve food for these poor children it was a solemn supper held in Smithfield upon the early return of the fair of St. Bartholomew and this uh, particular uh, event was held at this place called Smithfield and there uh, every year they would celebrate uh, the, the feast of St. Bartholomew and uh, so at that time along with the uh, feast of St. Bartholomew this also would be done that is an annual feast for the chimney sweeps. Cards were issued a week before to the master sweeps in and about the metropolis, confining the invitation to the younger fry. Now and then an elderly stripling would get in among us and be good naturedly winked at, but a main body were infantry. So uh, invitation cards were sent a week earlier to the master sweeps so that they may inform the small ones to attend this feast and uh, the invitation was limited it was specified that only the younger you know, chimney sweeps were permitted or invited to the party and sometimes an older sweep would also get in and they would be good naturedly winked at means and nobody would mind if it's just one or two they would be permitted to join but our main body were infantry but the main focus was on the young children on the small ones. One unfortunate white indeed who relying upon his dusky suit had intruded himself into a party but by tokens was providentially discovered in time to be no chimney sweep. All is so not suit which looks so. Was quoted out of the presence with universal indignation as not having on the wedding garment. But in general but in general the greatest harmony prevailed and so he also recalls an incident when uh, a man who was not at all not even a chimney sweeper but he happened to be wearing a dusky suit and then uh, um, Charles Lab specially mentions all is not suit which looks so so just because you wear a black suit doesn't mean black suit or a black dress it doesn't mean that it is suit uh, SOT suit and so uh, he was turned out he was thrown out of the uh, feast. It's just like when you go for a wedding and if you're not wearing wedding clothes or um, clothes that are appropriate for that occasion, you will not be let in. Same way here too, this man was um, thrown out. And then, but generally uh, such intrusions were very rare and uh, only children would attend the feast. The place chosen was a convenient spot among the pens at the north side of the fair, not so far distant as to be impervious to the agreeable hubbub of that vanity, but uh, remote enough not to be obvious to the interruption of every gaping spectator in it. So uh, this uh, annual feast was held as we said at uh, Smithfield during the uh, feast of um, St. Bartholomew. So there was a fair held there and people from far and wide would attend would come uh, to the fair and so this particular tent where this feast was held the feast for chimney sweeps was held it was situated a little away from the other stalls and the other tents north south side of the fair but it was not too far away so you could still hear the pleasant noises of the fair and uh, but it was not too close so that people would come and stare. It was placed at a safe distance. The guests assembled about seven. So by about seven o'clock, all these children, the invited uh, guests would start 
filing in. In those little temporary parlors, three tables were spread with napery, not so fine as substantial, and at every board a comely hostess presided with her pan of hissing sausages. So, um, inside the tent, three big tables were uh, arranged and uh, they were spread with napery. Napery means uh, uh, tablecloths and napkins and all that and they were not fine in the sense they were not uh, of that fine quality and style as would suit uh, uh, a grand dinner or something but it was substantial means it was enough they had a lot of that though the quality was less the number was great it, there were enough tablecloths and napkins for the occasion and uh, some uh, there were sausages hot sizzling sausages were kept in pans and they were comely hostess comely in the sense good looking young ladies uh, were standing there ready to serve these uh, hot sausages the nostrils of the young rogues dilated at the savour so as soon as they entered the tent uh, as soon as the smell the very appealing smell of the sausages assailed the nostrils of these children their uh, nos the noses would dilate the nostrils of the of the of the children would dilate at the good flavor and james white who was earlier referred to as jem white james white as head waiter had charge of the first table and myself with our trusty companion bigard ordinarily ministered to the other two so he says that um, the first table it was usually taken care of by uh, james white himself he was a sponsor of this whole program so he stood at the first table then the next table uh, were managed by myself that is elia and another very good friend of theirs called bigard okay now this bigard is actually uh, in another essay called two races the two races of men written by charles lamb this bigard or ralph bigard is one of the characters there okay so the first table uh, was for uh, james white the second table was taken care of by uh, elia and the third table was uh, presided over by um, this ralph bigard there was clambering and jostling you may be sure who should get at the first table for rochester in his maddest days could not have done the humors of the scene with more spirit than my friend so he says that though there were three tables there was a lot of jostling and clambering to find a seat in the first table why because james white was an absolute entertainer so all the children wanted to sit at the table where he used to serve food because he used to do all kind of funny things to keep them entertained uh, after some general expression of thanks for the honor the company had done him his inaugural ceremony was to clasp the greasy waist of old dame ursula the fattest of the three that stood frying and fretting half blessing half cursing the gentleman and imprint upon her chaste lips a tender salute whereat the universal host would set up a shout that tore the concave while hundreds of grinning teeth startled the night with their brightness so what uh, usually inaugural ceremony is this there would be some kind of a a general expression of thanks that is he would first thank all the children for having accepted his invitation and having come there that day so he would thank them first and then he would uh, clasp the waist he would put his hand around the waist of um, ursula ursula was one of those ladies who are uh, you know frying the sausages there he would put his hand in a very uh, romantic chivalrous manner around her waist and he would also uh, give her a, a tender kiss on her lips and then he would shout he would start uh, with one uh, shout and he would uh, set up a shout and then all the children so would um, smile instantly you remember what he already said about the smile of these children he said that it is like uh, on a dark sky uh, when a black cloud suddenly reveals a silver lining how beautiful it would be that is how the smile uh, is described the smile the white smile on a black face is described here so he says the moment this man uh, james white he puts his arms around ursula and kisses her on the lips and then shouts out immediately 
there would be so many grins all the children there would start grinning and that's why he says but hundreds of grinning teeth startle the night with their brightness so the dark night for a second would be illuminated with all these white smiles oh it was a pleasure to see the sable yonkers lick in the unctuous meat with his more unctuous sayings how he would fit the tidbits into the puny mouths reversing reserving the lengthier links for the seniors so uh, he says that it was a pleasure those days uh, during these events um, this to see the sable sable again black yankers only means youngsters they used to eat this unctuous meat unctuous here means uh, not exactly healthy oily because sausages are not very healthy food uh, when especially when they are fried they are oily you have oil oil flowing out of them that's why he says uh, he used to uh, encourage the children to eat this now for children we know that this is not a big problem because they have so much of energy in them and they would spend it running around and so a little fatty food is not going to cause much harm for them unless they eat it every day on a daily basis and don't do any exercise but here in the case of these poor kids within a span of one day all that they eat would be burned down because by the time they clamber up one chimney they would be completely exhausted so here he gives them this meat that is uh, the sausages and he also says all kinds of funny things um and uh, uh, a gross kind of jokes and how and he would also try to feed he would take small tidbits of meat and put it into the mouths of the small ones and uh when there are the lengthier ones the bigger pieces he would put into the mouth of bigger kids and how he would intercept a morsel even in the jaws of some young desperado declaring it must to the pan again be brown for it was not fit for a gentleman's eating and sometimes when a young man is eating he would interfere and say that oh that piece that you're eating is not fried properly i think it should go back for a for frying some more time and he would intercept he would interfere and take it away from the mouth of uh, a young man and so uh, he would recommend this slice and he would give uh, offer them bread and tell them why don't you eat this of that piece of kissing crust so another piece of crust and he would offer it to the children and encourage them to taste different items of food and to a tender juvenile advising them all to have a care of cracking their teeth which were their best patrimony how gently he would deal about the small eel as if it were wine naming the brewer and protesting if it were not good he should lose their custom so he would encourage them to eat he would also serve them ale and he, uh, it is ale that is an, an inexpensive ale but he would serve it as if it were wine and he would also uh, ask them about uh, the drink is it good enough and he would say that this is uh, the ale that i got got from such a such a brewer and if at all it is not good tell me i'll never buy again from them so I should lose their custom in the sense if there is any complaint against this ale uh, that the quality is not good he says that he will stop being the customer anymore so he says all these things and he mingles among these little children with a special recommendation to wipe the lip and he also tells them to uh, take the care of their teeth when they eat he says take care uh, a care of cracking their teeth don't hurt your teeth because the teeth is the best feature that you have because your smile is so beautiful so see that you don't uh, destroy your teeth and then uh, uh, when before they drink he also tells them wipe your lip before drinking then we had our toasts so then they toast to the king in the cloth which whether they understood or not was equally diverting and flattering for a crowning sentiment which never failed may the brush supersede the laurel and he also the cloth i think here means the cloth that these children use for cleaning and also the brush what is the brush the cleaning brush so he uh, they toast to all these things may the brush supersede the laurel the laurel is a sign of a winner 
of a warrior, of a king. Uh, so he says, may the brush supersede the laurel. Because for uh, a chimney sweep, the brush is his biggest weapon and it is his symbol of power. And so they uh, take toasts in the name of the brush. All these and 50 other fancies which were rather felt than comprehended by his guests would he utter standing upon tables and prefacing every sentiment with a gentleman give me leave to propose so and so so he used to say all kinds of things and these little kids oftentimes they did not really understand what he was saying but they felt the sincerity of his feelings he would clamber onto a chair and he would say okay toast to this toast to that and uh, uh, and each time he would call them gentlemen he would address them as gentlemen and that itself was a prodigious comfort to these young orphans because it's such a comfort because they were treated like dirt most of the time they were given no respect nobody cared for them so here at least once a year a man takes them to a place gives them good food talks to them like he would talk to other gentlemen so that was a great pleasure for them every now and then stuffing into his mouth for it did not be do to be squeamish for it did not do to be squeamish on these occasions indiscriminate pieces of these reeking sausages which pleased them mightily and so he says once in a while what he would do is he would also eat some of the food himself he knows it's not healthy and but then he doesn't squeamish is being very fuzzy about food not eating certain kinds of things not uh, touching certain kinds of drinks so he says he had no such squeamishness especially when everybody was eating he used to join them he used to make them eat he also used to eat it himself uh, reeking sausages reeking in the sense sausages that are have a strong smell and sausages that are you know uh, soaked in oil in spite of all that he too used to eat it and that would give again happiness to the children because he was eating what they were also eating so it gave them a feeling it, it kind of bonded them together which pleased them mightily and was the savouriest part you may believe of the entertainment so that is what the children like most of him being along with them toasting and at the same time eating sharing the food that he gave them golden lads and lasses must as chimney sweepers come to dust and now he says james white is extinct and with him these suppers have long ceased he carried away with him half of the fun the wor of the world when he died of my world at least his old clients look for him among the pens and missing him reproach the altered feast of saint bartholomew and the glory of smithfield departed forever and he says that my friend is now no longer alive he is dead that's why james white is extinct and what happened with his death this annual feast for the chimney sweeps also stopped it has ceased stopped and then he says that he when he died he was such a jolly good fellow such a good companion that when he died half the fun of the world he took away with him when he left and at least he says of my world because he was a lifelong friend of lambs so the death of this very dear friend james white um, affected him very badly and that is why charles lamb says at least he took away half of all the joys of my life joy and fun and then uh, he says his old friends his old clients they still look for him among the pens they look for him among the pens here i think the pens the various tents in uh, this uh, fair but then they don't find him and they reproach the altered feast of saint bartholomew so he says that uh, they when they don't find him they say that it's all because of uh, the saint bartholomew's feast the way of celebrating itself has changed and so they blame it on him uh, uh, on saint Bartholo uh, on the altered feast of saint bartholomew and when they are unable to find james white and the glory of smithfield departed forever and he says with the passing of james white smithfield became a very uninteresting and a barren place once upon a time it was a place where they were so happy together they used to attend the fair have such a funny time but now smithfield has lost its glory forever 
So that is how he ends. It's an abrupt ending actually uh, because he doesn't say anything about the chimney sweeps in conclusion. He just ends with uh, the sad um, demise of his friend James White. So we come to the end of the essay in praise of chimney sweepers and in this essay you can see that um, he reveals to us a lot of information about the sad plight of the chimney sweeps and though he doesn't openly say that it is a wrong practice we can uh, understand from the way he talks about many things that he believed it's a very cruel practice uh, taking away children from their homes forcing them uh, into the dark, dark chimneys was definitely not a right thing and he also believed that uh, people should help these children uh, get them food or help them at least in whatever way is possible so gives us an exposure it gives us a glimpse of a practice that was prevalent in uh, Britain during those times and it was a practice unfortunately that went on for a long time until finally it was brought to a halt and that is uh, all I have to say about the essay in praise of chimney sweepers and again as I mentioned earlier you can you uh, if you had have followed me throughout this essay read it along with me you can see how um, it is not an easy essay to follow uh, due to the reasons I had mentioned earlier a lot of allusions references to people that we don't know uh, many words that are uh, pretty bombastic and um, uh, long sentences that go on forever all these make it a difficult essay but in spite of uh, these uh, minor tests of patience the essay still remains a very popular one.